from the top rope, and the Great American Bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. July 27, 1998 Wrestling Observer Newsletter WCW Road Wild and Jay Leno Details, Akira Mater Retires, Tons More By Observer Staff So after WCW booked a pair of NBA stars into an abysmal match and wound up with the second best-selling pay-per-view in company history, we've got the case of going to the gimmick well one more time. Is it too soon? Is it just plain too nutty? And what will the result of this one me? Jay Leno agreed to do the next WCW pay-per-view as a main event participant on July 17th. His appearance had been in negotiation for several weeks. The belief likelihood that Leno would do the show that was the method to the madness that led to Eric Bischoff having WCW buy a Tonight Show-like set and do what was originally planned to be a weekly deal on Nitro where Bischoff would do a horrible Leno spoof. The planned weekly deal to set up the match ended after just one episode due to its utter destruction of the ratings the first time it was tried and how severe the head-to-head -head competition between WWF and WCW is to where even building a main event pay-per-view angle that they think will derive huge revenue they aren't willing to sacrifice audience by presenting television that bad. But the segment was back on July 20th basically to start the ball rolling on an angle that needs to be rushed badly because there's only a few weeks before the show put in the unopposed first hour although put at the very end of the hour and was so incredibly bad that it appeared to encourage everyone to switch to Raw just as Raw was starting, and the way the ratings patterns have been of late, WCW really doesn't need to be encouraging its viewers to turn to Raw late in its first hour, and made into a more personal deal with Leno. The match pretty much had to take place in Sturgis, since the Sturgis rally was part of the selling point in getting Leno. Supposedly the main angle will be done on The Tonight Show, probably in the next week or two, as opposed to on Nitro although nothing appears to be definite. Leno laughed his way through the Malone-Rodman angle although he was a participant in setting up those angles and exposed his own television show as being totally contrived and set up with him selling surprise guests when it was clear everyone was working an angle for the previous pay-per-view. Apparently the two nights with Hogan, Rodman, Page and Malone doing the angle the first night and Malone being on the second night drew higher than usual ratings for The Tonight Show, which is even more ratings conscious because of their own ratings war, than WCW would be. So because of that, Leno also was willing to do his own pro wrestling angle if it would help his own ratings. At press time the main event hadn't been finalized, but it was most likely going to be Leno and Diamond Dallas Page vs. Bischoff, and Hulk Hogan, although there has also been talk of making it a six-man with Kevin Eubanks, the muscular guitar player on The Tonight Show, teaming with Leno and Page and the disciple joining Hogan's team. There has also been talk of limiting Leno's role, and making it the originally planned Hogan vs. Page main event and simply have Leno, and perhaps Eubanks in Page's corner and Bischoff, and perhaps Disciple, in Hogan's corner, and involve Leno in the finish. From all accounts, Leno's scheduled between The Tonight Show and regular nightclub performances is booked solid so it isn't like he's going to have weeks to train and this really could be a farce of a main event like no match we've ever seen before. But that isn't the question, because Andy Kaufman's wrestling matches in Memphis were beyond bad and it really didn't matter as he usually drew well, but remembering that feud, when he was around two straight weeks the second week crowds usually went way down, but no matter what predictions are about dooming the company with bad matches. Historically Kaufman played a bigger role in Memphis than Leno ever did, and in no way hurt that wrestling company at the time, although they weren't in a close wrestling war at the time either. The question is, will it gain mainstream publicity? And actually that's pretty obvious that it will. But will that mainstream publicity translate into buys as it did for Rodman and Malone, who didn't mean one thing for TV ratings but still drew a huge buy rate. Wrestling has a long history of finding successful gimmicks and running them past the point that the public cares. If people see Leno, coming just a few weeks after Rodman and Malone, as the same gimmick, and that match wasn't well received although people bought it but they left the show with a bad taste, and at least Rodman and Malone are excellent athletes, the public may blow this off. There is the chance, although unlikely, that the wrestling fans may react in a manner that leads them to the WWF after WCW presents two main events in a row of such caliber, although we've seen promotions that are hot present one bad show after another with minimal and often no damage to business. But if the media hype is strong enough and Leno, who has great exposure with his own show pushes it hard enough, maybe the curiosity will sell another big buy rate. But even so, a match would be tough enough to get over to wrestling fans, but it's going to be a lot tougher in front of liquored up bikers that haven't exactly enhanced the previous two attempts at a pay-per-view from Sturgis. By any standards, it appear the August 8th WCW Road Wild pay-per-view will set new standards.
the Sturgis show, held outdoors, has been a flop every year on a number of levels. The buy rate is generally well below the company average although this year should be different. Nowadays, with business as good as it is, by doing a pay-per-view show for free, you're literally giving away anywhere from $300,000 to $400,000 in revenue from the live gate and concessions, perhaps more if Leno's thing clicks with the public although apparently part of the lore to get Leno to do the gig is that he's a biker himself. At the first show, it appeared the audience contained few wrestling fans, and it was a hard crowd to play. The second Sturgis show had more wrestling fans, but they were so lit up by the end of the show that they were throwing bottles at Hulk Hogan and the planned post-match celebration when Hogan regained the belt from Lex Luger had to be cut short for the safety of the NWO members. It's a hard audience to play for and a hard audience to book for, as the only thing notable on the first show is the only wrestlers who got real heat were Harlem Heat, and that was skin color driven as opposed to a measure of however they were. And who can forget at the same show Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit having a classic match to little interest and when they announced they were going five more minutes, the crowd booed, wanting them off the stage. This year, with Leno on top, it promises to be even scarier. In addition, there will be a 30-minute concert at some point during the show with country artist Travis Tritt, a mix that hasn't worked in the past when attempted on pro-wrestling pay-per-view shows. It isn't even clear what will be on the undercard. The only other matches scheduled to be released were Kevin Nash vs. Scott Hall, which both Hall and Nash were both attempting to nix because they believe, and correctly so in this case, that it's way too soon in the wrong place and they're hoping for their first singles match to be held off for Halloween Havoc and last word we had is that their match likely won't take place on this show. Raven vs. Perry Saturn with the winner getting control of the flock, and Chris Jericho vs. Juventud Guerrera for the cruiserweight title. In what was billed as the final career match for Akira Maeda, the wrestler who in many ways popularized the term shooting to mainstream Japanese wrestling fans, Ring set its all-time record crowd on July 20 by selling out the Yokohama Arena for the first time in its history with 17,800 fans. If it turns out to be the end of the career of the 39-year-old Maeda, it would have to be considered not only anticlimactic, but outright disappointing in what by all accounts was a bad show. Maeda was heavily booed after his match after being awarded the decision in a match against protege Yoshihisa Yamamoto, a wrestler who at one point was considered to be his heir apparent as the star of the promotion after making a name for himself in a Valley Tudo match by going 21 minutes before losing to Hickson Gracie during the prehistoric era where the Gracies had been beating everyone in two minutes and from that loss getting a huge push in this promotion before being knocked out in less than one minutes in a Valley Tudo match against huge Brazilian Ricardo Moraes. Due to injuries suffered from that knockout and other beatings, Yamamoto has not wrestled in a long time and his career as a major star is generally considered over. Maeda and Yamamoto were tied, with each having three lost points after the 20 minutes time limit expired, and it was announced that Maeda won the match via judge's decision, which got a strong negative crowd reaction. Maeda, who weighed 262 pounds for the match, the second heaviest of his career, looked old, tired and sluggish. Particularly in such a long match, and it was apparently clear Yamamoto was carrying the match and the fans boot heavily despite what would be expected to be a sympathetic reaction to a legend in his last match. Maeda reacted to the fans booing by saying over the house mic that he himself also thought Yamamoto should have been awarded the decision. There was no elaborate retirement ceremony at the show, although they did ring the bell ten times with Maeda in the ring after the show was over. Many of the leading pro wrestling stars of this generation were at the show, including Antonio Inoki, Nobuiko Takata, Genichiro Tenryu, Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Junji Hirata, Kazuo Yamazaki, Animal Hamaguchi along with longtime New Japan front office official and television color commentator in Maeda's days with the company, Kotetsu Yamamoto. Also at the show was former World Karate Association Cruiserweight Champion kickboxer Don Nakia Nielsen, who was the man in the ring with Maeda when he came the closest in his career to achieving what was almost a preordained end result as being the top wrestling star of his era in Japan and probably Maeda's most famous match on October 9, 1986 at Tokyo Sumo Hall. None of Maeda's former in-ring rivals or legendary contemporaries were brought to the ring, but all sat in the second deck at the arena watching the show and there was no post-match ceremony after his match. Even though the crowd turnout indicates otherwise, Within wrestling the Maeda retirement was somewhat subdued because of the hopes and perhaps plans of Maeda leaving with a bigger show against a bigger name opponent, with a lot of media talk of a Maeda vs Takata match at the end of the year, which still may take place. Maeda never quite reached the level he was being groomed for in the traditional world of wrestling, but made himself a legend by creating his own form of the product, which at times he didn't want to even be considered as pro wrestling because he was known for knocking pro wrestling as fake while portraying the product he was involved with promoting as real.
the strange paths his career took him probably made him one of the five most influential pro wrestlers of the past 20 years and the style his popularity largely spawned was years ahead of its time. If Antonio Inoki is considered as the forefather of the popularizing of the shooting movement, even though Inoki himself truly only had maybe one high-level shooting match in his life, with Muhammad Ali, then Maida, groomed to be his heir apparent as the top star in New Japan Pro Wrestling, would be the crown prince. Like the king, the prince was more a top shooter based on hype and presentation rather than actually proving it in legitimate matches against top fighters, and like Inoki, he'll probably still go down in his country with the reputation as being one of the great true fighters in the world of his time. But his popularity led to the second, third and fourth generation of UWF bread shooters, and Japanese pro wrestlers like Kazushi Sakuraba, Masakatsu Funaki and Tsuyashi Kosaka and foreigners spawned from the same system like Ken Shamrock, Frank Shamrock, and Boss Rutan, all of whom are considered and have proven themselves in legitimate competition to be right at the top of any list of the best all-around fighters in the world based largely on a submission system introduced to Japan decades earlier by Karl Gotch popularized by Meta's charisma in the 80s and heavily refined in recent years based on what does and doesn't work in top-level competition. It was Meta's charisma that paved the way to pro wrestling matches to become more and more realistic, and for those training in them to train in actual shooting, to the point where today it is the descendants of Meta in a sense that are some of the dominant fighters of any style in the world. The 6'3 Meta, who grew up in Osaka, in his youth was considered very large for a Japanese teenager and with a lot of agility from his background as a karate fighter, was recruited by Hisashi Shinma into New Japan Pro Wrestling in the summer of 1977 and debuted on August 25, 1978. Shinma's plan was for Meta, with his size, speed and legitimate fighting background, to be the successor for Inoki as the charismatic top star of New Japan Pro Wrestling who would also, in worked matches, of course, face and whip the top stars from other sports proving to a new generation that pro wrestlers were the toughest fighters in the world. And for a while it seemed this would be the case, but the end result of all that planning, as is usually the case in pro wrestling, saw the winds take over and something entirely different evolved. After a few years of learning his craft in prelims, Maida was sent to England, where he worked under the ring name Quick Kick Lee, billed as the larger cousin of Sammy Lee, Zatoru Sayama, who had taken the country by storm a few years earlier. Maida quickly captured England's version of the world heavyweight title, which he brought back to Japan and never lost, returning on a major show in April 1982 where he pinned Paul Orndorff to retain the title at Tokyo Sumo Hall. In the embezzlement scandals involving New Japan, Inoki and Shinma in 1983, the end result was that Shinma was booted out of the company and in early 1984, created his own new promotion called the Universal Wrestling Federation. When the original UWF was formed, the idea of it being a shoot promotion or a more serious version with less gimmickry than all Japan and New Japan was only a vague idea, as Shinma created the New Japan boom and was wanting to recreate what he already knew and did so successfully with Meta as his young stud. Shinma sent Meta on tour to the World Wrestling Federation to make him a worldwide star so he could come back and be his top star. Ironically, it was Meta's one major tour of the United States for the World Wrestling Federation in 1984 that may have been the catalyst for the entire movement. Shinma was at the time the figurehead WWF president and sent Meta to work for Vince McMahon Jr. where they would create a new version of the WWF International Heavyweight title, the same name for the belt that had become so prominent in New Japan due to the Riki Choshu vs. Tatsumi Fujinami feud that Shinma was attempting to get the WWF to disavow and make Meta the new champion. Meta was given a win in Madison Square Garden over Montreal jobber Pierre Lefebvre to win the title, but while he was on tour of the United States, relations between Shinma and McMahon worsened as McMahon was caught having to choose his business relationship between the established group, New Japan, and the company figurehead president, Shinma, and chose New Japan, although that relationship didn't last much longer either. As part of the politics, Maida wasn't given a push in the WWF and thus Shinma's top star was made into a jobber at the few arenas he was booked on, losing to the likes of George Steele and Rene Goulet and WWF chose to recognize the New Japan version of the international title, leaving Meta's belt that he came to Japan with as having little credibility and it was dropped soon thereafter. Meta returned, embittered against mainstream pro wrestling and in particular its unrealistic aspects and the idea of putting over a past his prime gimmick-like steel, and was the key figure in changing the UWF from what it was created to be, a more serious New Japan style, to the beginnings of a style that got more and more realistic, to the point that in recent years it has spawned a revolution that has become at times very real, although from a historical standpoint, the ones who deserve the credit for making a form of pro wrestling into being real would be the ones who actually took the step when Pancrase was formed in 1993.
Shinma talked Maida into leaving New Japan along with dojo submission expert Yoshiaki Fujiwara and Maida's little brother, the immensely talented Nobuiko Tera. Maida's long-term future was to eventually be the king, but instead his stardom was jump-started by doing with Shinma and not waiting and gained an immediate position as the top wrestler, but in a smaller and newer promotion. Shinma didn't last long in his new UWF creation as he didn't approve of the new style the wrestlers wanted to do based on Maida's urging, and then when business wasn't doing well and they wanted to bring Sayama into the company, Sayama hated Shinma, and the company had to choose between their creator and their biggest box office star and Shinma within a few months was completely out of the wrestling business. And with that the wrestlers, so somewhat in the spirit of Carl Gotch, who trained most of them, changed the future course of pro wrestling with the UWF ring style. Meta himself was the most outspoken, mincing no words about traditional pro wrestling offices having worked matches, and insinuating that the UWF was the real thing. Many fans believed it, however, at that time, outside of Tokyo, where the matches would overflow Karaku and Hall to a scary degree, the first UWF never caught on, as more than a cult thing. It had many strange chapters, but eventually folded in late 1984 and in January of 1985, made a return to New Japan for a strange three-year run that changed the course of modern pro wrestling. During 1985, there was probably no single match in the world in history that could have drawn the money an Inoki vs. Maida singles match would have done at a stadium. However, Maida at the beginning refused to lay down for Inoki, which was the finish the office wanted, so in the history of both men's career, there ended up being only one singles match, not legendary at the time but which later become historically significant with Inoki of course winning in 1983. One time an Inoki vs. Meta match was announced for Sumo Hall and the building sold out to the tune of $280,000 in a few hours, but it had to be changed to a 10-man tag team main event. Meta had great matches with Japanese wrestlers, in particular a noteworthy singles match against Tatsumi Fujinami, but didn't work well with Americans and Maida was generally outspoken about many of the American wrestlers that were brought to New Japan lacking wrestling ability. One time Maida was booked at Karakuen Hall, the building the old UWF was its hottest and the New Japan days was considered as something of Maida's home court, in a singles match against big-name American wrestler Kerry Von Erich, with a large percentage of the fans expecting to see Maida destroy the American bodybuilder type who those fans knew even though he had a big name, really couldn't wrestle. When the finish was a double count out the fans stormed out of the building mad at the promotion. New Japan did huge business in 1985-86 with the drama of the UWF vs New Japan feud with incredible heat from the hardcores, but the UWF style based on kicks, suplexes and submissions without much in the way of gimmickry and histrionics wasn't over to the mainstream and television ratings dropped to the point New Japan's weekly television show was moved from prime time. It's an interesting debatable point as to long-term wrestling if it was good or not. While New Japan, and Japanese wrestling in general, had periods of incredible record-breaking revenues after losing primetime television, there is no question that it hurt and to this day continues to hurt mass audience appeal when the television airs in poor time slots. Meta had the now-famous weird semi-shoot with Andre the Giant in April of 1986, and later that year on October 9, 1986 defeated Nielsen with a half-crab in a worked match in what may have been the single best mixed sports match in history on the undercard of Inoki's horrible win over boxer Leon Spinks, which is the match that finalized Meta as a true national hero since it drew a 28.9 rating in prime time. With such a huge audience watching, and Inoki's match being so poor and Meta so exciting, the forces behind Meta and a lot of the younger fan base felt it was time to make the big move to Meta as the top star in the company. But it never happened. And when Ricky Choshu and Masa Saito jumped back to New Japan from All Japan largely to have Choshu's popularity attempt to reverse the New Japan TV ratings decline just a few months later, Meta became one of many wrestlers in a muddled secondary position behind Inoki. The frustrations grew in 1987, and in an incident that from a long-term wrestling historical standpoint when it came to repercussions, made the Bret Hart slash Vince McMahon Survivor Series finish look like small potatoes, there was a shoot that drew so much money some people at the time thought it had to be a work. Actually there were rumors leading up to the incident, which again took place on UWF home court during a six-man tag with Meta and Choshu as respective captains. As Choshu put the scorpion deathlock on Osamu Kido, Meta came in for the save and delivered a real kick to the eye, breaking Choshu's orbital bone and it immediately swelled up and began bleeding. The match fell apart at that point, although Masa Saito, one of Choshu's partners kept it together long enough to get a finish before tempers flared even worse. Choshu, perhaps the top draw in the promotion at the time, was knocked out of action just a few days into the tag team tournament. New Japan had no choice but to suspend Meta for the rest of the year but somehow in all of this Meta came out of it as the hero. New Japan was willing to bring Meta back, 
but only if he accepted a punishment which included several months of having to work lucha libre style in Mexico, which would be considered cruel and unusual punishment for a guy whose reputation was based on realistic wrestling, and then return and put Choshu over clean in a singles grudge match. Instead, some friends of Meta's put together new backers and the second UWF was formed with Meta, now a much bigger celebrity in 1988 than he was in 1984, times had changed and the public was ready to understand a more realistic and serious version of fake pro wrestling. When the second UWF started, it was like the start of no new promotion ever in the history of pro wrestling. Its first card in May of 1988 sold out in 15 minutes, unheard of at the time for pro wrestling which in those days was largely a walk-up buy, and for the remainder of 1988, every monthly show sold out including a card at the Osaka Baseball Stadium. Due to his influence in changing the business, Meta become the first Japanese wrestler, and to this day remains the only wrestler from a company other than NWA slash WCW, All Japan or New Japan to win the Observer's Wrestler of the Year Award, in 1988, and certainly the only one to ever win it primarily based on influence as opposed to quality of matches. Like Inoki before him, Meta made his name as a shooter beating superstars from other combat sports such as Gerard Gordeau, Karate, and Chris Dolman, Samba, in worked matches. The UWF peaked for a Tokyo Dome show on November 29, 1989 for the legendary Yukosmo show, which set what is still an all-time record for pro wrestling selling 40,000 tickets the first day they went on sale, eventually selling out 60,000 seats in three days for a show headlined, by Meta beating Willy Wilhelm, a former European champion in judo which was the first pro wrestling event to ever sell out the Tokyo Dome, drawing $2.9 million live, at the time the biggest live gate in the history of the business. But due to mismanagement the second UWF folded a few years later and the stars broke up into several groups. Meta, with help of the Wow Wow channel, formed Rings. It should also be noted that K1 was formed in a sense from Rings, as promoter Kazuyoshi Ishii learned a lot about the pro wrestling business working with the early Rings office and Masaki Sadake, still K1's biggest Japanese star, were doing a kickboxer gimmick as the semi-final to Meta on many Rings shows in 1992 before the two branched out and created K1 the next year. Yoshiaki Fujiwara formed pro wrestling Fujiwara Gumi, and in 1993, stemming from PWFG, three of its younger stars, Masakatsu Funaki, Minoru Suzuki and Ken Shamrock, known as Wayne Shamrock in those days, formed Pancrase, which was the first true legitimate form of pro wrestling of the modern era. Nobuiko Takata formed UWFI, which actually was the most popular of the groups for several years, but eventually went deeply into debt and its wrestlers had to sell their credibility as shooters by doing worked losses and a lot of gimmick matches on various pro wrestling groups both large and small, then spawned Kingdom, which also didn't last long. In 1998, some 14 years after the first UWF was formed which was supposed to be real matches that of course were just a stiffer and more serious worked style, Meta's Rings promotion is generally running around 40% shoot matches, a percentage that is expected to grow with Meta and some of the other older stars of the group's early years like Folk Han and Dick Frey, fade from the main events. And it is Rings that is back on top as the most popular of the so-called shoot-style pro wrestling promotions, and has expanded with sell-out events in Holland, Russia, and Australia already this year. All the problems of testing top marketable stars in shoots became apparent this year when Tamura, the company's biggest draw, was soundly thrashed by unheralded Valentij Novarim, and caused a noticeable drop in attendance at recent cards. The trend reversed itself this week, but that was due to Meta, and doesn't bode well for the future. A lot of the popularity was of rings was due to Meta's name, but Meta's matches were usually disappointing as was his so-called final, as he didn't keep himself in top condition and was plagued by knee injuries from so many years of working such a stiff style, but the company was largely in the ring in recent years carried by younger Japanese stars who put on some classic matches. Among insiders for the past several years, and there was this sentiment dating back to the origination of rings, that Meta never kept himself in good enough condition to believably headline since the group is supposed to be a shoot group. But he was able to draw particularly against a name opponent. Obviously his drawing power diminished as time went on since it was based on a big name from the past. There are a lot of thoughts that Meta's career will have one last match, perhaps against former best friend Takata, and that perhaps even late this year after the Hicks and Gracie match, that Takata and Sakuraba, with nowhere else to go and remain active full-time in the pro wrestling world, would join rings following former Kingdom stars Kenichi Yamamoto and Hiromitsu Kaneara. In a surprise in the semi-final of the show, Bitsade Terio retained his rings version of the world heavyweight title with a knockout victory over Kosaka in 7:23. Kosaka was knocked down twice during the match and couldn't answer the bell after the third knockdown. 
Tamora defeated Wataru Sakata in 9.48 with an armbar and former UFC fighter Paul Verlins made his Rings Japan debut. He had won a match on a Rings show in February in Holland, losing via knockout to Joop Castell in 7.27 after Castell scored a number of time with hard kicks. If the ratings drawing power of Steve Austin had started to sputter in recent weeks due to overexposure, that certainly wasn't the case on July 20 as Austin boosted Raw to its seventh ratings win over the past eight weeks as total wrestling viewership was again at near record levels. Raw drew a 4.99 rating, 4.57 first hour, 5.42 seconds hour, and 8.13 share to Nitro's 4.34 rating, 4.68 first hour, 4.18 seconds hour, 4.15 third hour, and 7.24 share. The Nitro replay did a 1.3 rating and 7.1 share. Raw won 7 of the 8 quarters outright, with 1 quarter actually a tie in total viewers but Nitro winning by a percentage since TNT doesn't reach as many homes as USA. The show also put to rest the Bischoff theory from a few weeks back that when TNT moved to the new West Coast feed that Nitro would be back on top, when in reality it has meant almost no difference at all. Raw had two points where it actually was ahead by two full ratings points, both segments involving Austin. In the fifth quarter when Raw had an Austin interview, where McMahon came out and they set up the handicap match main event, Raw drew a 5.60 rating, up from a 4.4 the previous quarter, to Nitro's bottoming out at a 3.59 for Magnum Tokyo vs. Ultimo Dragon and Scott Norton vs. Jim Powers. In the final quarter, the finish of the X-Pac vs. My Via IC title match and the Austin handicap match against Mankind and Kane drew a 5.99 rating in 4,401,000 homes, up from a 4.8 the previous quarter, the second highest opposed quarter in Raw history trailing only the 4,414,000 homes that the McMahon vs. Steve Austin non-match from Philadelphia drew and slightly topping the 4,365,000 homes that the Austin vs. Kane title change on June 29th drew. WCW ended the show with Hart vs. Page to determine the vacant U.S. champion which drew a 3.97 rating or 2,907,000 homes. Nitro's lone victorious quarter, if you can call it that, was doing a 4.39 rating and 7.0 share for the Muda and Chono vs. Disco Inferno and Alex Wright tag team match, going opposite the LODDOA angle with the Bikes and Jeff Jarrett vs. Steve Blackman which drew a 4.37 and 6.9 share although both were in 3,214,000 homes. Nitro peaked during Hogan and Bischoff's interview with the entire black and white doing a 4.60, although it still lost to Raw's 5.01 for Hart vs. Farouk in the spot where Sable had her dress pulled off revealing her bra and panties and like any good Christian mother with a young daughter, she paraded around on television in front of nearly 5 million viewers in them. It's just a pity that Bischoff didn't understand modern religious values or she could have been doing that on Nitro. The only other thing of note is that horrible Bischoff segment did not hurt the ratings at all as it did the first time, although it was going unopposed and did a 4.8 rating and actually held the viewership from the previous quarter. In other words, the Austin interview spiked the ratings 28% over the previous quarter, and his match spiked at another 25% which made him the single biggest ratings draw in the history of the Monday Night Wars ever on a specific night. ABC World News Tonight on July 17 ran a feature called Inside Pro Wrestling, largely based on its strong cable television ratings. With one laughable exception, this piece came off far better than most media pieces as it addressed real versus fake, but came to the conclusion that it doesn't matter, and while addressing the new wrestling catchphrase of no good guys and bad guys. The companies internally as we all know continue to market the top stars as babyfaces and heels while Titan says otherwise because it makes good copy. The whole business of Austin being a unique babyface character is such incredible BS Austin is still nothing but a more successful modernized version of Ray Stevens, or Freddie Blassie as a babyface. But in taking the truism of no good guys, and it is true that the Vern Gagne or Bob Backlund style good guy is dead, as perhaps saying something about American society today, coming to the conclusion that people read more into a message that isn't there and it's really just a few hours a week of escapist entertainment, a soap opera for guys. The piece by Aaron Brown showed the top 10 rated shows on cable for the week, it was the week of July 6th to July 12th so WCW came out looking better in the standings since that was the week of the Hogan-Goldberg match, and claimed five pro wrestling shows were in the top 10. Of course that was misleading in that the five shows claimed were three separate hours of Nitro and two hours of Raw. If the NBA could break down its playoff games as four different quarters as opposed to one game, it could have 25 of the top 30 shows on network TV during the championship series. Even funnier, 
as the listing of the top shows had WCW at 2, 5 and 6 and WWF at 7 and 10, was that the number 9 rated show for that same week was the second hour of Thunder, which was listed in the graphic, but ABC News didn't realize was a pro wrestling show. They categorized pro wrestlers as actors who have scripts, that it's all fake, but that nobody seems to care. It didn't at all put wrestling down for being, in their words, fake, seemingly addressing the issue to put it behind them while examining just how big a business it has turned into. It claimed pro wrestling was the most watched thing on cable, and had USA Network's Bonnie Hammer, the same woman who didn't know that Steve Austin had turned babyface in some recent major articles talking about Austin as the wrestler that all the fans hate, claim more males 18 to 34 watch their wrestling than watch NYPD Blue, Cops, and Homicide, which I'd be almost certain isn't the case. Hulk Hogan was quoted as saying how the big advertisers are now getting into wrestling, which is true but there is still a stigma although it is breaking down. Vince McMahon said that the old style good guy is someone that today's fans would puke at. They talked about Val Venice being a modern wrestling character who is having an affair with his rival's wife. They called Austin the biggest thing in wrestling and showed fans with shaved heads entering the arena wearing his t-shirts. Eric Bischoff claimed WCW has gone from a $35 million a year company to where it is approaching $200 million in revenue this year, which is probably only a slight exaggeration. While there was no depth to the piece, nor did they have time for such, it was very much a positive piece for wrestling and a decent piece as far as TV news goes. The Not Knowing Thunder was a wrestling show on such a high-profile network piece is pretty much an unforgivable mistake, in that they didn't fall into the usual pattern of ridiculing wrestling for its lack of authenticity, and never knocked the fans for buying it or tried to show clips to portray fans as lower class or stupid. Surprisingly, they also didn't knock wrestling for the cruder presentation of the WWF, nor was ECW ever mentioned in the story and the producers were well of ECW's influence on the current direction of WWF. In pieces like this and the recent Time magazine article, even if they aren't well written or break no new ground, just the fact they are there adds to the visibility and mainstream acceptance of the product as it is. It is scary, however, that ABC News couldn't even see through the obvious bogusness of Nitro and Raw claiming separate hours as different television shows in having the five shows in the top ten on cable claim, nor that in a piece of pro wrestling, that they didn't even figure out that Thunder was a wrestling show. While they may seem like trivial errors, you have to figure errors of the same degree are being done in many ABC News stories and that's scary. The next major piece we're aware of will be in the August 15th TV Guide, which will be the cover story in the most widely viewed magazine in the country which will have Austin and Hogan both on the cover. Coming off a successful event on July 18th at the Nagoya Dome, K1 readies itself for its U.S. invasion with a few question marks regarding the main event. Peter Ertz, who was scheduled to face Maurice Smith in the main event on the pay-per-view on August 7 from Las Vegas, suffered an injured left shin bone in the first round of his main event before 33,398 fans at the Nagoya Dome against Francisco Filio, and reports were that his bone was literally sticking out from his skin and bleeding badly in between rounds and the doctor took a look at it and immediately stopped the fight. Because the match was stopped after only one round, promoter Kazuyoshi Ishii said on television that the two would soon be rematched. In addition, Andy Hug, who is scheduled against Mike Labrie in the other super fight in Las Vegas, missed this show apparently with groin pulls suffered in the days before his scheduled fight with Kirkwood Walker. According to K1 US promoter Art Davey, Hug's injury wasn't serious and his status for Las Vegas isn't in question. They were awaiting word at press time regarding the status of Ertz but one would have to consider it doubtful if if he could return from an apparently broken shinbone in three weeks. The K-1 television debut in the United States on ESPN, running in highlight form its Tokyo Dome Grand Prix Finals from last year, was moved from July 23rd to July 24th, airing at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Reports are the pro wrestling match on the K-1 Nagoya Dome show between Yoji Anjo and Naoya Ogawa under UFO rules, was not a success. The match was apparently so bad that it didn't even air on television although original plans were that it was supposed to, lasting 3.51 before Ogawa was disqualified for throwing a multitude of elbows from the mount in what was reported as an obviously worked match. Anjo played heel early delivering headbutts and attempting to thumb Ogawa in the eye, before Ogawa lost his cool from the fouls and began fouling back and refusing to break and was DQ'd. The match must have been really horrible, because a few days later at a press conference, both Antonio Inoki and Satoru Sayama of UFO admitted that the match was terrible. Getting this match on the K-1 show is part of New Japan and Inoki's promotional gimmick to establish UFO as a separate office from New Japan for the eventual interpromotional feud. UFO will include Anjo Ogawa, Don Fry, 
Brian Johnston Kazunari Murakami, who is most well known for EFC pay-per-view fights where he beat Bart Vale and suffered the most spectacular knockout loss in MMA history against Maurice Smith, and Yoshiaki Fujiwara among others. In the other televised matches from the K1 Nagoya Dome show, Jerome LeBanner of France beat Sam Greco of Australia with a second-round knockout in what was reported as a good match. Matt Skelton upset Masaki Sadake in 2.54 when Sadake was knocked down three times in the first round. Mike Bernardo knocked out Claude Vitoza of Brazil in 2.21 and Ernesto Hus knocked out Musashi in 2.51 of the second round. Japanese Television Rundown June 14, All Japan 1. Yoshinobu Kanemaru and Satoru Asako upset Super Delphin and Grand Naniwa in 11.55 when Asako pinned Naniwa. They edited it down to 5 minutes. 1 and 3 quarter stars. 2. Monukia Mossman in his final junior heavyweight title defense beat Asako in 10-12. Real good match although Mossman is still green in spots. This was the match Mossman gave up the junior heavyweight title afterwards. He was looking to be way too large for the division. Asako got a near fall with a Michinoku driver too which was called a super driver. Mossman won with a Hawaiian crusher, which is the same move as Mark Mero uses as the TKO. Asako looked really good carrying the match and Mossman looked good as well, but also still looked green in spots. Three and one half stars. July 4th New Japan. 1. Koji Kanemoto and Kendo Kashin beat Jushin Liger and El Samurai in 1535. The last six minutes aired. The story of this match is that Kanemoto and Kashin didn't work together doing double team moves and were yelling at each other. Aside from that it was the typical really good match with these guys. Kashin put Samurai on the top rope and gave him a running flying arm bar for a spectacular finish. Three and one half stars. Two. Stone Cold Scott Norton and Michael Wall Street beat Tadao Yasuda and Manabu Nakanishi when Norton pinned Nakanishi with a powerbomb in 219. Norton was doing the Bill Goldberg gimmick, even though selling a German suplex by Nakanishi, and winning quickly. Dud. 3. Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan and NWO Sting beat Osamu Nishimura and Satoshi Kojima and Tatsumi Fujinami in 1419. The last 830 aired. Kojima looked great with his facials. It would up with Chono using a kneeling figure four on Nishimura, who tapped out. Norton Wall Street and Chono all came out and worked over Fujinami and him out after the match so Tenzan could hit a diving headbutt on him. They played the NWO name as opposed to Aristris for this group over Big which is a sign that relations with WCW are strong again. 1 and 1 quarter stars. 4. Kanemoto pinned Kashin in 1317. The final four minutes aired on television. Kanemoto did a pescado into a chair being swung outside the ring by Kashin. Kanemoto did a standing power slam off the top rope in his highlight before finally getting the pin after a moonsault. Two and a half stars. 5. Liger and Dr. Wagner Jr. beat Tatsuhiro Takaiwa and Shinjiro Atani in 1502. The final 415 aired. Real good stuff as expected. Wagner wound up pinning Takaiwa after a hot shot and a Michinoku driver too. Three and one half stars. 6. Chono and Tenzan won a non-title match over Shiro Koshinaka and Mishiyoshi Ohara in 1024. NWO Sting and Norton came to ringside and attacked Akitoshi Saito of Heisei Ishgun who was watching the match from ringside. Several good near falls although it was boring early, ending when Tenzan used a tombstone pile driver followed by a new version of a sleeper. One and one half star. July 5th All Japan. 1. Gary Albright and Yoshihiro Takayama beat Jun Akiyama and Tamon Honda in 725 when Albright pinned Honda out of nowhere with a power bomb. Fans got into Honda against both guys due to all being somewhat with a shooter rep. Kind of a goofy style good match with a finish killing it. Two stars. Two. Albright and Takayama and Masahito Kakihara beat Akira Tao and Toshiaki Kaoda and Masao Inoue in 1605 when Takayama pinned Inoue out of nowhere. One star. Three. Akira Tao pinned Bobby Duncombe Jr. in 521 after a choke slam. This was a bad match. Only highlight was Duncombe attempting to do a Mike Awesome style running flip dive from the ring to the floor, but he didn't clear the top rope, and his legs hooked the ropes, and sent him straight down on the ground. Match went downhill from there as Duncombe was probably knocked silly from the misdive. One quarter of one star. July 11th New Japan. 1. Fujinami and Kensuke Sasaki and Kojima beat NWO Sting and Norton and Hiro Saito in 1249. Only the last 3.30 aired ending when Sasaki beat NWO Sting via submission with the power strangle. 
After the match, Henzon, Wall Street and Chono all hit the ring and got rid of all the faces and surrounded Fujinami, trying to injure him before his scheduled title matches upcoming with Tenzan and Chono. Rather than attack Fujinami, all the NWO wrestlers cut a promo on him instead so he wound up escaping injury. 2. Samurai and Kashin beat Atani and Kanemoto in 12.37. The last 7 minutes aired and it was spectacular. Fast-paced and explosive with all kinds of big moves ending when Samurai used his Samurai Bomb, followed by what may have been the debut of a new finisher, an awesome-looking reverse tornado DDT on Atani for the pin. 4 stars. 3. Liger pinned Wagner in 12.32, Final 5.30 aired on television. Good solid wrestling throughout, ending when Liger scored the pin after a brainbuster off the top rope. 3 and a quarter stars. 4. Koshinaka and Ohara beat Hiro Saito and Tenzan in 10.37. Final 4 minutes aired. It was fast-paced and generally a good match with Ohara pinning Saito with a clothesline. 2 stars. 5. Sasaki and Kazuo Yamazaki beat Takashi Izuka and Fujinami when Yamazaki made Izuka quit in 14.35. Final 4 minutes aired. 1 and 1 half star. 6. Norton Chono and Wall Street beat Kojima and Nakanishi and Shinya Hashimoto in 7.48. Entire match aired. Hashimoto was in his first match back after a bad case of the flu. He looked great as all his offense was stiff and on target. It wound up with Hashimoto getting overpowered and Tenzan used a diving headbutt, followed by Saito doing the senton and Chono then hit Hashimoto with a Yakuza kick. Only the shortness of the match as a main event was negative. They ended up doing a Nitro-like post-match where everyone was brawling with everyone in the aisle. 2 and 3 quarter stars. Mexico. Perhaps the two biggest shows of the year in Mexico took place over the past few days. The biggest match of the year was July 20th in Nuevo Laredo with La Parca vs. Pierroth Jr. in the Mask vs. Mask match which it is assumed that Pierroth would be losing his mask in. Although Parca has not been wrestling anywhere near Mexico City or Tijuana since the Bill Goldberg match in WCW, he has continued to wrestle in border towns near Texas to build up this match which is going to turn into a real messy situation, since he's under contract to WCW. WCW is under the impression he tore his ACL in the Goldberg match, and like Randy Savage, he may be working on a bad will although reports are he isn't limping during his match but the Mexican wrestlers are also trained to work with injuries that Americans would be smart enough to take time off for. And because all the Mexican wrestlers under contract to WCW have been told that they can't work Mexico any longer unless they are booked through WCW. There is a good chance that WCW would book its wrestlers to EMLL for an EMLL vs WCW feud at Arena Mexico. There were reports that they were expecting a crowd of around 30,000 for this match, which also included Vampiro and Mascara Sagrada and Lismark Jr. vs Pirata Morgan and Psicosis and Pimpinela Escarlata, the biggest drawing card in Huevo Laredo, and Super Parca and Antifas del Norte and Felino vs Damien and Halloween and Super Crazy. We didn't get a report on the show at press time but did hear that on July 19th and I believe the same city or it may have been a nearby city where Pierroth and Parca opposed each other in a six-man to build up the match the next night that they drew the second largest crowd in the history of that building and that this show was going to obliterate every area wrestling record. The other big event was July 18th at the Palacio de los Deport, a 30,000-seat stadium in Mexico City, which was a one-night tournament involving 32 masked wrestlers in which the ultimate loser would unmask. The only report we have at press time is that it drew a huge crowd, not a sellout, but close to it. There was a lot of newspaper press including big interviews with people like Mil Mascaras, El Eo del Santo and Tinieblas Sr. talking about the possibility, yeah right, of them having to lose their mask on the show. While there were a few no names on the show booked on the card included Santo, Mascaras, Shocker, Tinieblas Sr. and Junior Felino, Mascara Magica, Angel Azteca, Villano 3, Lismark Sr., Super Astro, Fishman, Rio de Jalisco Jr., Violencia Zapatista, Universo 2000, El Eo del Gladiador, Blue Panther, Dr. Wagner Jr., Ray Bucanero, Shu El Guerrero, Scorpio Jr., Solar Atlantis, Mr. Niebla, Fantasma and Mascara Sagrada which are a lot of big deal masks. It started as a 32-man battle royal, with tag teams formed by elimination. They will continue on as a tag team tournament where the losers advance through four rounds and the final two losers of the tournament have a singles match. Don't know how it all went down but Santo and Guerrero de la Muerte were the tag team that lost the tournament by dropping four matches in a row, and I don't have to tell you who won the singles match between the two of them and who is Sans Mask. 
EMLL is promoting a two-night tournament for the Legend of the Silver Mask in honor of El Santo with it taking place the next two Fridays, on July 24th and July 31st with 16 men. The timing is said to be because El Santo's first match wearing the Santo mask was July 26, 1942. AAA, which is relying heavily on gimmickry since the talent, with two or three exceptions like Heavy Metal and Pero Agueo Jr., is so horrible, is now headlining with Metal versus a new heel called Heavy Dracula. On June 30th in Pachuca during a cage match with Heavy Metal and Mascara Sagrada AAA version, against kickboxer and Abismo Negro, Metal was about to escape to win when Dracula attacked him right in front of Il Ref Tirantes who did nothing about it, which allowed the heels to win. Super Luchas had a cover story a few weeks back on Juventud Guerrera's wedding to Laura Perez, 19, which took place on June 19th and mentioned that at the wedding were Fuerza Guerrera, Rey Mysterio Jr., Psicosis, Rey and Psicosis were the groomsmen, along with Conan, Super Colo, Black Magic, Lismark Jr., and Lady Victoria. Reports are that WWF Raw is getting really popular in Mexico and WWF would draw well if they came. A lot of the younger Mexican audience prefers to more modern WWF style to the stale lucha style employed on television. Arena Mexico on July 10th had Brazo de Plata and Mr. Niebla and Shocker vs. C and Cars and Mascara Año 2000 and Universo 2000 Negro Casas and Felino and La Fiera vs. Santo and Bestia Salvaje and Scorpio Jr. and Mascara Magica and Mr. Aguila and Olimpico vs. Rey Bucanero and Ultimo Guerrero and Valentine Maya. July 17th at the same building was headlined by Niebla and Shocker defending the CMLL World Tag Titles against Universo and Cien Cars. Vampiro and Teen Yablas and Brasso de Plata vs. Wagner and Magic and Mascara Año 2000, Casas and Fiera and Pantera vs. Santo and Scorpio Jr. and Viano 3 and Aguila and Ultraman Jr. and Yoshihiro Tajiri vs. Ultimo Guerrero and Karloff Lagarde Jr. and Maya. EMLL on July 14th at Arena Coliseo ran another tournament, this time a tag tourney where a star would team with a younger wrestler, EMLL is really trying to get over new stars right now ending with Emilio Charles Jr. and Tony Rivera beating Bestia Salvaje and Guerrero de la Muerte in the finals. Grupo Revolución ran a show on July 17 in San Juan Petitlan with Mascaras and Santo and Rayo against Wagner and Grand Marcus Jr. and Mr. Steel, not Val Venice Triple A has a big show in Tijuana at Auditorio Municipal on July 24 with Latin Lover and Octagon and Pero Aguayo Jr. vs. Picudo and Cibernetico and Fuerza Guerrera. Heavy Metal vs. Kickboxer, a lumberjack match with Duro e Directro and Oscar Sevilla vs. Pero Russo and Depredator and Syndrome and Shochitl Hamada and Miss Janeth vs. Rossi and Alda Moreno. All Japan. A correction from last week. The next tour which starts on August 22nd, doesn't end on September 9th but instead ends on September 11th, and the final show will be at Budokan Hall. A few fairly high-profile matches this past week. July 15 in Osaka Furitsu Jim drew 3,200 with Akira Tao and Toshiaki Kawada retaining the double tag team titles beating Gary Albright and Yoshihiro Takayama in 1951 when Kawada pinned Takayama after a hard kick to the face. The semi saw Kenna Kobashi pin Masahito Kakihara in 9.50 after a Lariat and Johnny Smith and Wolf Hockfield and Johnny Ace beat Jun Akiyama and Manukia Mossman and Takawamori in 12.14 when Smith pinned Mossman after a reverse DDT. July 18 at Karakuen Hall before a sellout 2100 saw Hiroshi Hase return for the first time since the Tokyo Dome teaming with Ace and Kobashi to lose in the main event to Albright and Takayama and Kakihara in 1928 when Albright scored a big win pinning Kobashi after a dragon suplex which should set the two of them up for a title match. July 19 in Niigata before a sellout 2,950 saw Hase and Akiyama beat Kobashi and Mossman in the main event in 21:53 when Hase pinned Mossman after a Northern Lights suplex. Most of the focus of the match was Akiyama destroying Kobashi's bad knees with dragon screws, and this match along with the tag title match on July 15, aired on the July 19 TV show with them pushing Akiyama working Kobashi's knees as a setup for the July 24 singles title match at Budokan between the two. The storyline is that Kaoto was a good sport and didn't go out of his way to attack Kobashi's bad knees. But that Akiyama, who has never won the Triple Crown, has said he'll do whatever it takes to win his first singles world title. Kaoto and Tao won a non-title over Takayama and Kakihara when Tao used the choke slam to pin Kakihara in 1332. Smith and Hockfield retained the All-Asian Tag Team titles beating Headhunters in 18-23 and in the finals of the tournament to crown the new PWF Junior Heavyweight Champion. Yoshinari Ogawa pinned Satoru Asako in 15-31 after a back suplex. 
June 28th TV did a 2.9 rating. There was no television show on July 12th due to the network covering the elections all night long. New Japan The final show of the last tour was July 15th at Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center before a near sellout of 6,000 fans with Genichiro Tenryu and Shiro Koshinaka capturing the IWGP tag team titles from Masahiro Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzan in 25-10 and Tenryu pin Chono. Tenryu now wears long black pants similar to the white pants Koshinaka wears and is basically regarded as a full-fledged member of Heisei Ishigun. Between this result and Tatsumi Fujinami beating Tenzan the night before lends one to believe that Chono will capture the IWGP heavyweight title for the first time in his career at the Tokyo Dome on August 8, particularly since Chono is known in Japan as Mr. August because, among other things, he won the first ever G1 Climax Tournament in August 1991 and he captured the NWA World Heavyweight Title Tournament in August of 1992. In the other top matches on the show, Jushin Liger retained the IWGP Junior title pinning Koji Kanemoto in 28-27, Shinya Hashimoto and Satoshi Kojima beat Keiji Muto and Michael Wallstreet in 9-49 when Hashimoto pinned Wallstreet, and Kazuo Yamazaki and Kensuke Sasaki beat Don Fry and Brian Johnston when Sasaki made Johnston submit to the power strangle in 8-39. New Japan announced the four teams in its tournament to create the first IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions which starts July 31st at Sumo Hall and ends on August 8th at the Osaka Dome. The teams will be Liger and El Samurai, Shinjiro Otani, and Tatsuhiro Takaiwa, Kanemoto and Dr. Wagner Jr. and Kendo Kashin and Yuji Yasurioka. Several more matches have been announced for the Osaka Dome show. Great Muda and Great Kabuki team up against Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara, which is something of a disappointment as fans expected some special opponents for the Muda and Kabuki tag team. Also Koshinaka vs Tenzan, Osamu Nishimura and Yamazaki vs Takashi Izuka and Tadao Yasuda and a singles match with Great Sasuke, who will face one of the junior heavyweights whose team has been eliminated in the tag team tournament. WCW got New Japan to cancel Sasuke's match with Shinjiro Otani at the Tokyo Dome in January because he worked WWF and ECW dates, but since he isn't working with either company now, WCW has apparently agreed not to complain about Sasuke on this show. After Osaka Dome, New Japan will be off until September 10th for one of the major tours of the year until September 23rd, with major shows on September 14th in Sendai, September 15th at Karakuen Hall, September 16th in Niigata. September 18th in Maibashi, is September 19th at Nagoya Aichi Gym, September 21st at Osaka Fury 2 Gym and September 23rd at Yokohama Arena for a show called Big Wednesday 98 and will feature four title matches. June 27th TV did a 2.9 rating. New Japan's TV was preempted this past weekend. Other Japan Notes Koji Kiao had his retirement match beating Koki Kitahara on July 19th in a 130-seat building in Tokyo in 244. There will be a retirement ceremony for Kiao at the KRS, Gracie Takata, Tokyo Dome show on October 11th. Fuji Network broadcasted AJW for the first time in several months on July 19th, airing the show held earlier that day at Karakuen Hall where Kumiko Makawa kept the All-Pacific title beating Nani Takahashi and where Zapai and Zap Nakahara beat Momoe Nakanishi who is the best young wrestler in Japan, and Manami Toyota in the main event saw Yumiko Hata and Takako Inoue go to a 30 minutes draw. The Zaps interfered attacking Hata several times, and they are trying to get Inoue to join the Zaps, which is kind of funny because the Zaps wear masks and full body suits and Inoue is probably the prettiest girl in the promotion. They gave their kendo sticks, same as Sandman's gimmick, to Inoue but she refused to use it throughout the match until hitting Hata with it once at the end of the match, which kept the speculation going as to whether or not Inoue would join. Great Sasuke's comeback has already had its problems. Sasuke injured his knee the first day of training. He still worked his scheduled first match back on July 18th in Yahaba in front of 1080 teaming with Masato Yakashiji to lose to Yone Jinjin and Super Delphin. They did an angle where Sasuke injured his shoulder in the match and he'll be out of action for at least one month because of his knee and shoulder problems. Ultimo Dragon wrestlers Shimo Nobunaga and Sumo Fuji and Judo Suwa are working prelims on this Michino Couture. Kengo Watanabe, the 22-year-old All Japan College rugby star, 6'3", 220, who has been in training with Pancre since January makes his pro debut on the September 14th pay-per-view show from Budokan Hall against Boss Rutan, which is quite an opponent for someone's pro debut. FMW President Arai will be wrestling on August 11th at Karakuen Hall in a tag match teaming with Atsushi Onita. Hey, hasn't he lost something like 200 loser must retire matches by now? 
against Hiramichi Fuyuki and Hill manager Go Ito. Onita hit the ring as a surprise in his first match back in Japan in seven weeks on July 20th in Mito but team no respect. Fuyuki and Yukihiro Kanemura and Koji Nakagawa still beat Onita and Mr. Pogo 2 and Yoshinori Sasaki in the main event. Great Kabuki and Kendo Nagasaki are forming a main event tag team for IWA the second indie world show at Karaku and Hall on July 22nd was to include the return of Kayantai and Taka Michinoku from WWF. Taka and Asian Cougar were to headline against Palomino and Masao Orihara, while Kayantai were to face Tarzan Goto and Masashi Aoyagi and Azteca on a card that would also include an AJW main event, Yumiko Hara and Kumiko Maikawa vs Takako Inoue and Manami Toyota, and appearances by old-time stars Yoshiaki Fujiwara and Yoshiaki Yatsu. CMLL tours Japan from August 19th to August 24th with two shows in both Karaku and Hall and KBS Hall in Kyoto, August 19th at Karaku and Hall has El Eo Del Santo at Atlantis and Lismark Sr. vs. El Satanico and Parata Morgan and Fishman, Mr. Niebla and Antifas Del Norte vs. Black Warrior and Ray Bucanero, Damien and Ultimo Guerrero vs. Subasa and Mono Negra Jr. and Ultraman Jr. vs. Archangel. August 22nd in Kyoto has a CMLL six-man tag title match with Atlantis and Niebla, and Lismark defending against Satanico and Morgan and Bucanero. August 23rd in Kyoto has an NWA light heavyweight title match with Black Warrior vs. Bucanero and final show on August 24th at Karaku and Hall has Santo and Lismark Sr. and Atlantis and Niebla and Antifas Del Norte vs. Satanico and Morgan and Fishman and Bucanero and Black Warrior plus Super Delphin vs. Subasa and Ultraman Jr. and Mono Negra Jr. and Masato Yakashiji vs. Ultimo Guerrero and Archangel and Damien. Here and there. The second Mid-South Coliseum show for Memphis Power Pro on July 21st drew approximately 2,500 fans. Jerry Lawler beat giant King Paolo Silva via countout after throwing fire at him in the main event. After the match, Randy Hales was yelling at Silva for losing and Silva threw him in the ring, where Stacy gave him a low blow and sat on his face. There are men who would pay a lot of money for that, and Lawler gave him three pile drivers. Brian Christopher beat Rocky Maivia via DQ in the IC title match when Kid Wicked interfered after a ref bump attacking Christopher, but Maivia didn't want his help and went for the urinage on him. Ref Bill Rush blocked it so Maivia gave him the urinage for the DQ. Christopher hit Maivia with the title belt after it was over. Bill Dundee beat Coco Ware in a double juice dog collar match most notable for the fact that Dundee and Ware shared the same blade which is pretty much insane in this day and age. In the tournament to crown the first Power Pro tag champs, Bulldog Reigns and Billy Travis beat Rock and Roll Express in the tourney finals when Travis hit Ricky Morton with a guitar. Music City Wrestling is now running four shows per week in the Nashville area, with every Tuesday at a local night club called the Mix Factory, Wednesday at the Expo Center, Friday in Lebanon, Tennessee and Saturday at the Nashville Fairgrounds. Louisville has been cut back from every Tuesday at Louisville Gardens to monthly with the next show on August 2nd. Most of the area main events are Wolfie D and Flash Flanagan vs. Stephen Dunn and Reno Riggins. The tag titles held by Dunn and Riggins were held up when Dunn was suspended for giving a ref a DDT on the floor. Recon of the Truth Commission showed up at the July 15 TV tapings to do an angle with Colorado Kid. Everyone was raving about a high-flying lighter weight match on the tapings with Shannon Moore, who wrestles Carolinas as Kid Dynamo against Will of the Wisp. Jeff Hardy Jake Roberts spent three nights in prison in Jacksonville, Florida after he was picked up for non-payment of child support. Bruno Sammartino appeared on a show for transcontinental wrestling run by EFA and Sal Corrente as a guest referee for the Dominic Danucci vs. Nikolai Volkov main event. I believe that Danucci has to be in his mid-60s by now. There was a big scare at the July 17th New Dimension Wrestling Show in Concord, NC. The main event was Buddy Landell vs. Tully Blanchard and Blanchard's knee or ankle gave out as he was lifting Landell up for a suplex and dropped him right on his head. Landell actually finished the match, which went 29-30, putting Blanchard over, but after the match was carried out and taken to the hospital in an ambulance for fear of a broken neck. As it turns out, he's okay. There was an article in the July 8th Chicago Sun-Times regarding an insurance fraud probe which included a payment by former pro wrestling promoter Paul Alperstein, AWF, that may or may not relate to Alperstein's now defunct company. Alperstein gave the insurance firm, Specialty Risk Consultants $300,000 allegedly to invest in a golf resort the firm was helping fund. According to the story, in the early 90s, Alperstein told Tito Santana that he wanted to get into the wrestling business. Santana then introduced Alperstein to Steven Signore. Signore then introduced Alperstein to the Spano family, who have mob ties.
Paul Spano, who Alperstein never met, plead guilty in 1993 in a federal crackdown on racketeering in Cicero, Illinois. In early 1994, Power Slam Promotions was created with Alperstein as president, Anthony Spano as director and treasurer, and Signore as corporate secretary. In late March, Alperstein claimed he was taken to a golf resort and invested $300,000 in it even though he didn't know who owned or managed it and wasn't familiar with the company he made the check out to, Specialty Risk Consultants. What they are trying to tie together is Alperstein's investment with Cicero Town President Betty Loren Maltese, who invested political campaign funds in the same resort, and also used the political fund to buy $6,000 worth of tickets to an Alperstein pro wrestling show in Cicero. Alperstein was also given one of the city-owned buildings for no rent for another show, and other matches were videotaped in a TV studio owned by John Credito, a Loren Maltese supporter. However, the claim is that Loren Maltese did not control the booking of the city-owned building. Axel Rotten ran his first show of the Maryland Championship Wrestling promotion on July 19 in Baltimore as competition for the Mideastern Wrestling Federation. Rotten drew a packed house of 1,180 and it was said this didn't have the feel of an indie show as the lighting was really good among other things. Among the wrestlers who worked the show were Rotten, Balls Mahoney, Tommy Rich, Tracy Smothers, Little Guido, Devin Storm, Julio Sanchez, Stevie Richards, Jerry Lynn, Pitbulls, Ed Bangers, and Jim Cornette. Next show is back at Patapsco Arena in Baltimore on August 16. Aaron O'Grady and Vic Grimes were pulled from the APW tournament since both are scheduled to start in Memphis sometime next month. It is expected that Michael Modest of APW will get a WWF tryout, if only as a favor for Barry Blaustein's wrestling documentary movie, probably on September 15, in Sacramento. Empire Wrestling Federation is running August 2nd in Rialto, California, at El Patio Nightclub and August 1st in Lancaster, California, at the Pool Television Studios. Former New England Patriot Fred Smirlis did a run-in on the NWA New England show on July 9th in Swansea, Massachusetts. World Wrestling Alliance is running August 20th in Salem, Massachusetts at the high school, August 21st in Quincy, Massachusetts at the Armory, and August 22nd in Newburyport, Massachusetts at the Armory for shows that will largely include wrestlers from the August WWF training camp. Plus Sergeant Slaughter, Darren Drozdov, Edge, Ed Bangers and Pat Patterson will appear. Don Lewis will be running his second show at the Coca-Cola Roxy Theater in Atlanta with Tommy Rich vs. Doug Gilbert on top. NWA New England runs August 1st at Liberty Honda in Hartford, Connecticut with Jim Cornette appearing. In what is being billed as the first pro wrestling show in Melbourne, Australia in 20 years will be August 6th at the Metro Nightclub build as Junior Kickstart Wrestling. NWA All-Star Wrestling on August 1st in Union, South Carolina headlined by Dustin Rhodes vs. Barry Windham and August 5th in Sanford, Florida headlined by Rob Van Dam vs. Jerry Lynn, Sabu vs. Hack Myers and Dory Funk vs. Bobby Duncombe Jr. MCW Georgia on July 30th in Loganville, Georgia headlined by Billy Black vs. Rex King. MMA The UFC pay-per-view on July 17th which was a compilation of famous matches from the past and with a first-run showing of the Frank Shamrock vs. Jeremy Horn middleweight title match was a big disappointment. From watching the show, it made it appear UFC was on its last legs as the show itself was dead, without much in the way of transitions from match to match and simply ended abruptly, without even a sign-off, after the tape of the Shamrock match with a show that lasted only 1 hour and 50 minutes which had to majorly piss off people who had spent $19.95 for the show. There was almost no hype at all for the next show other than the announcement it would air on October 16th and be called UFC Brazil, and it was said that Randy Couture would defend the heavyweight title, Shamrock would defend the middleweight title with no opponents named for either match, strange since it has been already announced almost everywhere that Couture's foe would be Boss Rutten. And that Rutten would appear along with Vitor Belfort. The latter announcement was a surprise, even for many within the company as the word we get is that the odds of Belfort appearing on that show aren't good. They also did a feature on Rutan trying to push him as the new star of the promotion, billing him as a three-time King of Pancrase, well, actually two-time, and mentioned that he holds wins over Frank Shamrock and Maurice Smith. It was interesting watching the Shamrock-Horn match on television after seeing it live. Live the main thing about the match was that Horn was out-wrestling Shamrock most of the way, although at no time was Shamrock ever in real danger of being hurt or losing. Watching the tape, even though Horn was dominant when it came to positioning, it was Shamrock who was the one always looking for the opening and going for finishers while Horn was clearly just trying to hang on to his positioning and get the decision. While the latter is a viable strategy to win at the sport and if the match had ended at 15 minutes he would have earned the decision, realistically the fight was closer during regulation than it appeared live.
To show just how thrown together this came off as, just before they abruptly went off the air without even signing off or hyping the next show and there were no interviews on the entire show building up the next show, they aired the interview Shamrock had done live after his fight where he challenged Alan Goes, which was taped before Goes was knocked off in the first round of a tournament later that night but has absolutely no relevance now since Goes isn't about to get a title shot. It wasn't a good night for Dan Severn, as he's only lost three MMA matches in his life, and they showed three Severn matches and guess which three they showed. Why the Rutan vs. Couture match may not have been announced is that there is some consternation over the fact Rutan agreed to the title match, but also agreed to work the Pancras pay-per-view show in Japan just three weeks before the fight. The working idea for the show is to have a middleweight tournament, a Couture vs. Rutan match, a Shamrock vs. Dan Henderson match and a Mikey Burnett vs. Pat Militic match to crown the UFC's first lightweight, under 170, champion. The proposed UFC show in November at Tokyo Budokan Hall isn't finalized. Sergio Battarelli's International Valley Tudo Championships take place on August 23rd in Sao Paulo, Brazil and will have eight-man tournaments both at the 198 and 154-pound weight classes and a few superfights to be announced. Dan Severn has an NHB match scheduled for August 4th in Honolulu against Chris Franco. Matt Fury will be holding a submission wrestling seminar at his martial arts school in San Jose on July 25th held with Tony Sekin, who is a submission wrestling expert. Luthez will also be at the seminar. For more info you can call 408-448-6818. ECW There was a riot of sorts at the ECW show on July 17th in Staten Island, New York. We've talked to a half dozen people who were there and no story is close to the other. As best we can tell, it was the typical Dudleys inciting the crowd, but too many of the fans were drunk and it got out of control. Big Dick Dudley was hit by a cup of beer and overreacted by going over the rail. There were reports that after this happened, Bubba Ray Dudley challenged anyone in the crowd to hit the ring and some fans tried and security was having trouble keeping them from hopping the rail and the Dudleys helped security, and while this was going on, fans were throwing chairs. They did end up having a scheduled main event with Dudleys vs. Tommy Dreamer and Sandman and Spike Dudley, although fans were throwing things the entire match and chairs were going everywhere. According to the Staten Island Police, both Alex Rizzo, Big Dick Dudley, and a 13-year-old fan were arrested on assault three charges for starting fights. They claimed there could have been many more arrests as there was a lot of fighting among drunk fans both in the building and in the parking lot after the show. While promoter Dan Cowell told the local newspaper incidents like that were a rarity and that it's never been that bad in the past, others are claiming this incident wasn't as bad as several of the more publicized problems ECW has had in the past in places like Jim Thorpe and Plymouth Meeting. The building was right next to the police station so it wound up with 12 police cars showing up. Big Dick Dudley spent the night in prison and there's a possibility he could be in trouble since he's on parole and was released only a short time before the show the next night in Philadelphia but did work the show. The show drew about 1,500 fans and was said to have been a real good non-TV show up to that point. New Jack was scheduled to jump off a truck but with all the problems that was cancelled. Bam Bam Bigelow did the spot where he throws a ref into security on the other side of the guard rail but the ref didn't fly far enough and ended up being smashed on the rail. Taz did jump off a van onto Bigelow, who caught him. Sabu's work was said to be tons better this week than last and Masato Tanaka has gotten over big in every building when he does the big comebacks after the hard chair shots. Nothing new to report on the next pay-per-view show although there is a lot of speculation that Beulah is done with the promotion. The original plan was for her to return as a surprise on the pay-per-view show. July 18th at the ECW Arena drew a sellout of approximately 1,400. It opened with Taz cutting a promo on Shane Douglas, saying that most of the wrestlers from ECW stayed and were loyal but Douglas left to go to the WWF. Condito and Storm hit the ring and tried to do the Rolling Thunder spot that Sabu and Van Dam do on Taz, which brought out Sabu and Van Dam. Taz, Sabu and Van Dam cleaned house and Bill Alfonso went to shake Taz's hand but Taz refused, however Taz held him his FTW, three stars the world title, belt while Sabu and Van Dam held up their tag titles. Overall the show was said to have a lot of blood and most of the matches were okay with Sabu and Van Dam over Condito and Storm for the tag titles, ending when Storm turned on Condito, leaving him in the ring to be pinned being pretty good, and Tanaka and Jerry Lynn over Just Incredible and Mike Awesome stealing the show. That ended when Awesome used the Awesome Bomb on Tanaka over the top rope through a table, however in the ring Lin pinned Credible to win the match. Primo Carnera 3 returned as Big Guido in the FBI. 
Joel Gertner, who is absolutely the greatest, announced that if Sandman and Dreamer and Spike could win two of the three singles matches on the show that he would shave his head and that Dreamer's team could pick the stips for the pay-per-view, but if the Dudleys won two of the three, that he could pick the stips. Bubba pinned Dreamer in a bad match with outside interference from Jack Victory and the new Jack run-in. Sandman beat Devon in a short match which was good because it was mainly Kane shots, and it wound up with Big Dick pinning Spike. They'll probably announce the stips on TV this week. Very little of note on this week's TV show. They were supposed to tape in Worcester, Massachusetts but there were problems from the building so they showed a few matches from the previous ECW Arena show. The clips of Tracy Smothers vs. Tanaka from Worcester, which was good fast-paced match with the same finish where Tanaka takes a few hard chair shots and comes back with this incredible tornado DDT that puts Chavo Guerrero Jr. to shame, were really dark like old Kansas City wrestling in the 70s which probably explains why it was the only thing from that card that aired. WCW The coroner listed the official cause of death of Louis Mucciolo, Louis Spicoli, as atherosclerotic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy syndrome, which is basically a heart attack from having an enlarged and damaged heart. That is basically the same cause of death as Brian Pillman's last year and probably there were similar situations that caused both deaths. They are purposely not tipping their hand to the final member of the Four Horsemen, with Dean Malenko, Chris Benoit and Steve McMichael, because WCW is making another big effort to get Ric Flair back promising that the Horsemen would be marketed heavily and even the idea of calling them Four Horsemen 2000 a gimmick that did just wonders for revitalizing the LOD. The plan has all along been David Finley, but he hasn't been pushed on TV of late or involved in any of the angles. The tentative plan is for Jim Helwig to debut on August 17th Nitro from Hartford, Connecticut. I just hope WCW promotes it hard because if they don't let people know on television for at least one week ahead of time, they won't even get one rating out of him and no matter what, his shelf life isn't going to be long. If they try and do their surprise gimmick, he won't help the ratings that week and they'll have already given away his return without the ratings boost that it should bring. WCW has already taken the steam out of Goldberg's title win by not following it up and keeping the momentum going. He's got no program and the TV is still all built around Hogan, so it's like his title win meant nothing, similar to Hogan killing off the title while Sting held it. Hogan would be a valuable part of the company until he's 60 if he'd just move into the role Baba and Inoki took in Japan when they were washed up and it was time to build the new stars. In Inoki's case, he came back for big shows as a special attraction, but it was always clear the main events, with a few exceptions, were the younger guys and he was just the garnish and not the main course. In Baba's case, he is 60 and still around but he's kept himself in the middle of the show and nobody minds that physically he's an old man because he isn't in the main event. And both of those guys owned, or in Inoki's case partially owned, their companies and were smart enough to see the future. With Hogan, since he doesn't own it, he certainly doesn't care about the future and just uses the company as his personal vehicle to remain a star and if the company goes, not that it is in any danger of going anywhere with business like it is but it's not going to win the ratings regularly for a long time, he can always go back to the WWF. In the 80s, there was a lot of time when fans thought Inoki should step aside and he finally did about the time he was Hogan's age and even though Inoki was clearly past his prime then, he at 55 is a better worker than Hogan at 45, but he did have the Senate to go to to placate his ego but he was also tons more over than Hogan. But Baba never held his own company's major title after 1985 and Inoki's last world title reign was 1988 and both continued to be valuable members of the company while at the same time the companies both created new superstars to keep them flourishing and going to bigger heights until all Japan sputtered the past two years. July 20th Nitro from Salt Lake City, Utah drew a sellout 9,603, 8,744 paying $211,658. They mentioned the E-Center as the house that Goldberg built since Goldberg's Nitro debut was September 22nd in the same building. Naturally to make perfect sense out of all this, Goldberg never appeared on the show. Stevie Ray without the TV title pinned Johnny Boone with the slapjack in two minutes. Ray said that Booker T had the belt at home but then Chavo Guerrero Jr. showed up with the belt and gave it to Ray, who then tried to hide it from the camera. Rick Steiner did an interview and challenged Scott Steiner to a match at Road Wild, Marcus Bagwell came out in the wheelchair and said he forgave Rick for what happened. Rick and Bagwell were both stumbling all over their words. Scott Steiner, looking even freakier than the last time we saw him, came out and hit Rick with a chair. Bagwell got out of his wheelchair all unsteady looking like he was trying to stop Scott, but then turned on Rick and jumped around like he was fine, took off his shirt to reveal a black and white NWO shirt. This was a very good angle. 
but the timing of it was mind-boggling. WCW literally pissed away a lot of money as they could have drawn a huge rating and a lot of money early next year for Bagwell's return as a babyface, and then turned him back hill at the height of his popularity and he could have been one of the top heels in the company at that point. Now it's all gone and when he finally wrestles, he'll have been around TV enough that nobody will care, and he won't be able to be elevated. But none of that matters because they needed to do a show-long storyline where Hogan's group goes over on everyone so Hogan doesn't lose any more heat by having put Goldberg over. Chris Jericho did an interview and talked about Dean insulting him about his father dying, said that Dean and Arn Anderson conspired against him to give him a beating and said next week in San Antonio at Nitro that he'd be giving Malenko one last chance at the title. Steve McMichael pinned Sick Boy in 129 with a tombstone. Bad but at least it was short. Finally they did the awful Bischoff segment where he did Jay Leno's Friday monologue, and then cracked a few chin jokes with this awful canned laughter soundtrack while you could see the people who paid for wrestling tickets wanting to commit homicide, suicide, genocide or at the very least a violent castration. Bischoff wanted to go out with a fake nose and chin as well but was talked out of it. In the first hour, they had exactly 329 of wrestling and it consisted of squashes with Ray and McMichael. They began showing a tape of the Kevin Nash interview from Thursday but Scott Hall ruined the tape. It wound up with a brawl in the backstage area which was one of the fakest looking fight scenes in the history of not only wrestling but also B-movies. The classic highlight was Nash whipping Hall into a garbage door and they misjudged how far away it was and Hall literally had to jog to get there. Bret Hart showed up and challenged Diamond Dallas Page to a match right then and there and then they showed Page laid out backstage like he'd been mugged and J.J. Dillon said to hold the match up until the end of the show. A lot of good that did. Yuji Nagata beat Perry Saturn in 323 when Raven DDT'd Saturn and Nagata put on the Nagata lock and Saturn was pinned by a submission hold. Hey it's the only way, because tough guys don't submit. Flock went to attack Saturn. Kidman is dressing nicer by the week. Canyon made the save including giving Kidman a pile driver off the middle ropes. Last time I saw a move close to like that was the night Akira Hokuto got her neck broken. Move got a bigger pop than anything Canyon has done to date. Canyon helped Saturn, and for his troubles, Saturn gave him a Death Valley driver. Hall and Giant won the tag titles from Nash and Sting in 1208 in a great match with Super Heat. Who would have ever figured that? I mean, you'd think it would have some heat. Everyone had their working shoes on. Sting was about to put Hall in the Scorpion when Hart ran out. Sting shoved down Hart and the two argued, allowing Hall to get behind Sting and drop him with the edge for the pin. Great Muda and Masahiro Chono beat Disco Inferno and Alex Wright when Muda made Disco submit to a knee cross in 217. Scott Norton came out and destroyed Disco and Alex after the match. The wrestling was great, but everyone turned to the Steve Austin interview as Ultimo Dragon beat Magnum Tokyo, or as the Disleyxics in WCW refer to him Tokyo Magnum, in 227. Norton destroyed Jim Powers with a power bomb in 229. No heat. Norton didn't sell a thing. Hogan and Bischoff did their typical monologue trying to set the stage for the Leno match. Conan beat Eddie Guerrero via DQ in 429. Conan came out with Antoine Carr of the Utah Jazz. Real good match. Chavo came out dressed like Conan and was hilarious. Best Conan match in a long time. Eddie tried to hit Conan with Pepe, but Conan got Pepe away and used him as a foreign object. Somehow in all this Eddie was DQ'd, I guess for horse thievery because nothing else makes sense. Eddie took an incredible backdrop over the top rope after the match. Kurt Hennig beat Lex Luger in 520 in exactly what you'd expect from a Luger match. Rick Root interfered freely after a ref bump but Luger racked him. Hennig then used the fisherman suplex but Root held Luger's legs down for the pin. Finally Page came out with his knee taped, his ribs taped, the only guy in history who's had his ribs taped longer than Page is King Tut that line is the latest in the slew of jokes fed to me late Monday nights by people with giant-like senses of humor his head taped, etc. for his match with Bret Hart for the vacant US title and apparently for the number one contender for Goldberg. Page just sold for 252 before submitting to the sharpshooter. Page went out on a stretcher and into an ambulance where he'll be fine next week, while NWO Hollywood celebrated in the ring although they stopped celebrating Tuesday at 4 p.m. Despite all kinds of rumors to the contrary, WCW has no plans to do a pay-per-view or a Nitro from Australia in 1999. WCW doesn't even have any serious plans to tour anywhere until domestic business cools down. Thunder on July 18th from Oakland, California drew a sellout 14,477 in the revamped new arena which was 13,393 paying $293,975. It was a special three-hour show and it was the best Thunder in a long time and a pretty darn good house show for a change.
It drew a 3.80 rating, which is also the best Thunder rating in a long time, 3.19 first hour, 3.99 seconds hour, 4.15 third hour, and a 6.9 share on the live show and a 1.9 rating and 5.4 share on the replay. Due to being there live and having poor audio, and not seeing a tape of the show yet, I can't comment on everything. There were two dark matches. In the first, Blitzkrieg and Super Dragon beat American Wild Child and Dragon Yakuza. Didn't see the match but it was said to have been okay, but a lot of people were raving out Blitzkrieg, who is a smaller guy who can do great acrobatic moves and they were doing topes from hell. In particular, Ultimo Dragon was really impressed. The other tryout match saw Tom Howard, who has wrestled as KGB and AAA and Zuma elsewhere, lose to Viano 4. This wasn't good as Howard slipped off the ropes and apparently that took everyone out of the match. The show opened with a Nash interview talking about Hall turning on him again which apparently was a great interview. Conan beat Dandy. Conan got a great reaction. Dragon beat Lismark Jr. in what people were telling me was a real good match. Public Enemy beat Disco and Alex via DQ and Magnum screwed up a grunge table shot for the DQ in a bad match but better than most PE stuff. Jim Duggan pinned Roadblock in 441. Lots of boring chance in this one. Saturn pinned Canyon after a Death Valley driver in 553. Crowd literally died once this got started even though it was a well-worked, good match. People were filing to the concession stands and they were doing loud we want flare chants during the near falls. Eddie beat Psychosis in 6 minutes in the best match on the show. Eddie and Psychosis both did great planches. Chavo came out and tried to first help Psychosis, but he didn't want any help. He then hit Psychosis with Pepe, but actually missed and not only that, Psychosis didn't sell the miss which is better than 95% of the wrestlers would improvise on a blown finish spot. Chavo then shoved Psychosis off the top rope and Eddie hit the frog splash. Hall did his interview. Don't know what he said but he had great heat. Somewhere in all of this heart did an interview and for a guy who isn't over, he sure is over. People were making him target practice with a notable egg shot. Don't know what he said, and probably nobody in the building knew either, but he was getting over with them. Norton beat Cyclope in 38 seconds with a power bomb. People were wanting to hate this match but it ended before they had a chance. Stevie Ray beat Damien in 238. People had their chance to not care about this match. Rey Mysterio Jr. and C. Hooven to Guerrera in 721 when Hart came out and clocked both with a chair and put Juvie in the sharpshooter and Ray in the figure four around the post. Ray and Juvie didn't do as much wild stuff as you'd think, although they got some in, but their timing up close was incredible. Off the page stuff. Usually when a big star beats up two undercard guys in this type of an angle, even if the big star is a heel, the fans cheer the run-in. Boy was that not the case here. Not sure if Hart is such a good heel, or if they were just mad because he interrupted a real good match, but he became tomato target practice. Barbarian and Hugh Morris beat Chris Adams and Marty Jannetty in 247 when Morris pinned Jannetty after a moonsault. Meng did a run-in and nearly killed Jimmy Hart in the process. Dean Malenko did his second interview of the show with Steve McMichael and Arn Anderson. When Anderson did his promo about being a horseman and not wanting to be a part of the group's reformation, it was classic stuff. One of the best interviews of this or any other year with Anderson still acting like he didn't want to reform the horseman. Finally Hennig and Hall, the former AWA tag champs, beat Conan and Page in 1501 when Hennig pinned Conan with a fisherman suplex. Match was okay but with real good heat. Dark match main event saw Goldberg pin Giant in their first ever singles meeting in 257. Goldberg, wearing a knee brace and with his forehead all marked up from headbutting inanimate objects, sold the entire match. Finally getting choke slammed. He jumped early which screwed up the move somewhat. He kicked out, hit the spear and tried the jackhammer, but Giant was just too big and he couldn't make the turn so it was just a vertical suplex, but Giant stayed down for the pin. Goldberg got a great reaction, but it wasn't much better than Conan or Page. The backlash on him is already starting as there were tons of Goldberg posters, more than anyone else in the company, second was Flair, and he's not in the company, but a good 20% of them were negative with things like Goldberg can't wrestle, Goldberg sucks, BX says Goldberg suck it, and one in response to his quote in the New York Jewish paper about his matches being real, saying Goldberg, don't you know wrestling is fake. When he came out, if there were any boos, they were totally drowned out, but you couldn't miss all the negative posters. The wrestling show outdrew the A's game held in the same complex a few hours earlier which drew around 10,000, a point that wasn't lost on a lot of people in the mainstream sports community the next day. Other house shows for the week were July 17th in Stockton drew a sellout 2,333 paying $46,145, 
July 19 in Sacramento drawing 9,217 paying $172,392, July 20 in Spokane, Washington drew 10,008 paying $185,749, and July 21st in Yakima, Washington drew a sellout 6,539 paying $117,133. The Yakima crowd is amazing because the entire city only has a population of 50,000. Merchandise for the week was $456,949 or $9.10 per head. Stockton was supposed to have a double headline of Page vs. Hart and Giant vs. Nash. Nash and or Giant were complaining about being hurt and not wanting to work hard on a house show in a small building so Page and Hart did a no contest when Nash and Giant interfered, and turned the main event into a tag match with Paige using the diamond cutter to pin Giant. Sacramento, Spokane and Yakima all had Goldberg vs. Hennig as the finale going around 5 minutes although the main event advertised in all cities was Sting vs. Giant which Sting won clean. In Spokane, after the main event, the fans pelted Hennig with everything that wasn't nailed down and he nearly went after a fan. In Yakima after he lost, the agents yelled at him to get to the back so they didn't have a repeat performance. The matches with Guerrera and Psicosis vs. Damien and Halloween were said to have blown away everything on the shows all three nights. Due to injuries, Booker T vs. Chris Benoit turned into Stevie Ray vs. Steve McMichael which is the drop-off from hell. Negative stars every night. For a lot of reasons, GDP seems to be the brunt of more wrestler jokes than anyone else in the company. Anyway the situation you've probably heard about the guy in Orlando last week who was impersonating DDP and wrote a bogus check to a Toyota dealership for $32,000 and drove away with a Toyota 4Runner, and tried to write another bogus check to buy a nightclub, and get this, he even had his girlfriend believing he was DDP. Anyway his name was Marvin Lee Jr. and he has a history of writing bad checks. The joke among the guys is that everyone thought the guy was DDP and he was 50 years old, although by the end of Nitro they had him up to being 70 years old. Ultimo Dragon Surgery on July 21st in Atlanta will be on both elbows and the palm of his hand, not his knees as mentioned last week. Lots of people noted that WCW was plugging all weekend that it would show the Hogan-Goldberg match on the July 13th Nitro and it never did. Page, Nash and Goldberg are being used as the spokespeople for the opening of the Nitro Cafe in Las Vegas. Although it looked like 15 or more pounds since he's a smaller guy, Rey Mysterio Jr. actually only put on about 8 pounds while he was gone. The OJs are said to be suing DDP and Malone for stealing their costumes. Hey, that's another wrestler's joke. I only come up with jokes on bad wrestlers and basketball players who paid $750,000 for one night and show up in no condition to work. No thunder the next two weeks due to the Goodwill Games. Time Warner as a company announced profits of $101 million during the second quarter of 1998 on revenues of $3.6 billion. The cable television division which consists of TBS, TNT, CNN, CNN Headline News, Cartoon Network, Turner Classic Movies and WCW gross $906 million during the quarter up from $750 million in the second quarter last year. This was the first time I can recall that Time Warner listed WCW as one of its main companies under its umbrella when talking about the big company's financial success. The WB Network, which is actually picking up WWF programming, Probably the shotgun show repackaged in some of its smaller markets ranked 101 to 200, generated $61 million in revenues but $84 million in expenses so that division is a loser so far. Bagwell did an internet con when people who knew he didn't need and didn't use a wheelchair asked why he used it on the two TV broadcasts claiming it was for insurance reasons. In the latest on the WWF lawsuit against WCW, Titan attorney Jerry McDevitt has gotten the original court ruling overturned that Mark Madden is a journalist and thus is protected from revealing his sources. In other words, McDevitt earned the right to subpoena Madden again and ask for who his sources were for various items. It's a very controversial ruling but the specifics of Madden's role is also a very unique case when it comes to what is and isn't journalism. I believe the decision was that while Madden is a journalist, what he does on the WCW hotline isn't part of his job as a journalist, and that he's there primarily to promote WCW and to entertain. Both Nash and Goldberg have upcoming stints booked on the new Love Boat TV show. WCW Saturday night on July 18th drew a 2.0 rating. WWF At press time, the revamped lineup for the July 26th Fresno pay-per-view show is Kane and Mankind defending the tag titles against Austin and Undertaker, Rocky Maivia defending the IC title against Hunter Hearst Helmsley in a 2 out of 3 fall match, 
which will build up to some sort of a rematch in a ladder match at SummerSlam. Sable vs. Jacqueline in the Bikini Contest and Shamrock vs. Owen Hart taped in the basement of Stu Hart's home in Canada with Dan Severn as referee, Vader vs. Mark Henry, D. Low Brown defends the European title against X-Pac, LOD 2000 vs. Skull and 8-Ball, Farouk and 2 Cold Scorpio vs. Bradshaw and Terry Funk and Val Venice vs. Jeff Jarrett. The Shamrock Hart match will be taped ahead of time so it can be edited, in the famed dungeon, which has mats on the floor, a low ceiling, no ring and no ropes. It hasn't been taped at press time and not sure when they're sending the guys up there to get it done. It's interesting on a lot of levels, not just because it's a unique environment for the match, but also because Stu Hart is letting WWF tape a pay-per-view match in his house after everything that went down last year in Montreal. While Owen is his son and WWF may be paying him for using the house and the money may come in handy in saving the house, is still a slap in the face at Brett because of how the WWF treated him. WWF will be running a one-hour primetime show on the USA Network on Sunday nights from August 2nd to August 30th starting at 7 p.m. Exactly what the show will entail hasn't been 100% finalized, but the leading idea seems to be to do a show with a live feel. that would actually be taped at the tapings probably starting in Anaheim and San Diego, and be similar to a Raw. The show won't be going head-to-head -head with any WCW pay-per-view show since WCW's August show is on a Saturday but the debut of the show will go head-up with the first hour of the ECW pay-per-view show except on the West Coast where there will be no head-up competition. To avoid competition from itself, WWF is moving the SummerSlam start time to 8pm on August 30th. SummerSlam has officially sold out Madison Square Garden which will be about 18,800 people in a gate in the $700,000 range. It's too soon to read anything into whether it will end up leading to a second weekly primetime television show, although obviously with the ratings Raw is drawing, USA Network would like a second night with those kinds of numbers as it's in its own ratings war with the other cable networks. WWF in the fall season will also be getting a weekly show on the small market WB network stations which will apparently wind up being a reformatted version of Shotgun Slash Challenge, interesting if only because the WB network is part of the Time Warner family which WCW is a part of. Some notes from the July 20th Raw which was taped July 14th in Binghamton, New York before a sellout 4852 paying $107,140. There was some noticeable editing throughout the show. There was no big mysterious reason why the entire 8-Ball vs. Scorpio didn't air other than they ran long, as part of the McMahon interview that opened the show was edited with a new transition voice done in studio by McMahon, and the entire Austin slash MC Mahan storyline leading to the handicap match was also heavily edited with a major jump cut. D'Lo Brown beating Triple H for the European title was a one and one half star match. All the internet reports about how the office stole the match from Pierre were a joke. The first reports we'd heard late Tuesday night were that Steve Williams got over and won handily, then all week we heard reports, many emanating from Montreal, that Pierre was ahead on points in both boxing and wrestling and did a controversial stoppage to protect Williams. In the first round, Williams controlled the stand-up and scored two takedowns while Pierre got one takedown to make it 15-5. In the second round, Williams had Pierre stunned for a standing eight count, easily won the stand-up and also scored a takedown to make it 35-5. In the third round, Williams was just pounding the hell out of Pierre before the ref had to stop the match. Pierre basically collapsed after the match so at the time of the stoppage the score was 50-5 which is not a close score at all. Williams got a little tired, but Pierre was totally exhausted by the finish. Nobody apparently thought about it beforehand and you really can't make a big deal about it because nobody brought it up, but it was a real bad idea to put Pierre in there because he has no vision in one eye. There's a reason boxers aren't allowed to fight with poor vision, because they can't see the punches coming from that side and Pierre was getting rocked by punches he couldn't see coming. In addition, with potential eye damage inherent in boxing, putting someone in without vision in one eye makes for a second risk if the good eye gets a few punches. Pierre wanted to do it but it would have been a better idea if he wasn't in it on a lot of levels. Pierre also asked the office for a copy of the tape because he believed it was unfairly scored and that he should have won. Val Venice slash Wally Yamaguchi angle is kind of silly. The model who plays Mrs. Yamaguchi-san looked great in the faraway shots, but when they were doing close-ups this week, she, who is actually 17, looked like a little teenager that age or even younger and the whole skit came off more like child abuse than spousal abuse and kind of was uncomfortable to watch. Is Jason Sensation the illegitimate son of Steve McMichael? Shawn Michaels was much improved when limited to commentating on two matches rather than being out there for two hours. Based on the clips that aired of the Scorpio vs. 8-Ball match, it appeared 8-Ball destroyed him in the first round, then blew up really bad and Scorpio won the next two rounds. 
the spot where Michael's hugged ex pack was edited off television so from a storyline standpoint he still hasn't addressed the DX deal. He continued to play total babyface on commentary. Rocky vs. x pack was a good match, although no better than the tag title change on Nitro. It had a few great near falls but the finish with the second ref telling the first about Triple H's interference was lame because if you can do that on finishes, why would there ever be outside interference finishes in wrestling if a backstage ref would come out? Well, it allowed China to deck Jimmy Quarteris for being a stooge. Triple H got an obviously plant to take her top off. If they do stuff like that on TV, they won't have to plant fans in the arena for long because fans will think it's part of the show. Similar to all the fans who think throwing garbage at the end of the show is part of going to a WCW live event. Despite reports to the contrary, WrestleMania in 1999 will definitely not be at Sky Dome in Toronto. Not sure where it will be held, although lots of rumors about Philadelphia. Sky Dome will host a live Raw in February. Almost all the major house shows from this point until the end of the summer will be triple threat matches on top with Austin Undertaker and Kane, plus Maivia vs. Triple H, Shamrock vs. Heart submission matches, Outlaws vs. Brown and Kama, Vader vs. Henry and LOD vs. DOA. The July 25th Cow Palace main event scheduled as the same tag as Fresno was changed to the triple threat, which will be the first one, with Pat Patterson as referee. Nassau Coliseum on August 21st will also have a Nation vs. DX 8-man cage match. That show sold about 5,500 tickets for $150,000 the first day they were put on sale this weekend. Anaheim and Fresno this weekend are both close to if not completely sold out while San Diego for the July 28th TV taping still was only a little more than half sold as a press time which is why they are doing a lot of media appearances on July 23rd in that market with Shamrock and Undertaker. The working plan for Brawl for All at this point, with seven matches left in the tournament, is to now do one match per Raw show for the next seven weeks. Based on the original bracketing the next four weeks should be Steve Blackman vs. Bradshaw, in Anaheim on July 27th, Savio Vega vs. Darren Drozdov, in San Diego on July 28th, Dan Severn vs. Bart Gunn, August 10th in Omaha, and Williams vs. Scorpio, August 11th in Des Moines. If they did both semifinals on August 24th in Philadelphia, they could still do the finals at SummerSlam, or they could space it out to a later Raw. There is the possibility of them redoing the bracketing because this is pro wrestling. Vega has a pinched nerve in his neck and hasn't been wrestling but we're told he will be in the brawl. Drozdov and Hawk went to a draw, and they were originally going to rematch them with the winner meeting Vega, but Hawk got a broken nose in the match with Drozdov so they are just putting Drozdov in. The brawl did a 4.5 rating, beating the 4.4 with WCW having Sting and Nash vs. Giant and Hall, which is saying something since Williams is basically an unknown to US fans at this point and Pierre has no drawing power. Eclipse of 8 Ball vs. Scorpio did a 4.8, which beat WCW's 4.4 for Conan vs. Eddie and Luger vs. Hennig, which has to be considered another plus for the brawl concept when you compare the marketability of the respective names on each side. WWF is doing a training camp this week, which includes among others, Apollo Dantes, Tarzan Boy, Papi Chulo Miguel Perez, basically to get his timing back after being out with a back injury, Andrew Martin, Christian Cage, Steve Regal, who is still not 100% physically from the effects of pneumonia, and will be kept off TV and reintroduced with a bigger push. Ted Annis, who will probably wrestle as Teddy Hart, the nephew of Brett and Owen Rhino Richards, Timber the Lumberjack, Paolo Silva, and Sean Stasiak. They are very high on Tarzan Boy, a former stripper from Monterey who is a good worker considering he's only been around about two years, and it wouldn't shock me to see them build the WWF Latino show around him as the top star. Jesse Jean missed all the house shows this past week due to his wife being hospitalized. Undertaker wasn't at the shows because he wasn't booked all week, although he did a public appearance at the kickoff for the August 21st Nassau Coliseum ticket sales, so Vader got to work a lot of main events, either doing a tag team with Austin against Mankind and Kane, or work singles with Kane while Austin vs. Mankind headlined. The Austin matches have been moved in most cities from the final match on the show to the final match before the first intermission so they can get Austin out of the building as there have been problems in a lot of cities with fans getting so rowdy when he leaves and trying to beat on his car and stop him from getting out. Brian Lee has been out of action with a broken nose and hand injuries suffered in a nightclub brawl several weeks ago. His wife was also injured in the brawl. Lee may be repackaged with a new role. A correction from last week regarding the shotgun show that airs this week. The stripper with the giant breasts who did the gimmick with Jackal in Binghamton goes by the stage name of Rachel Rockets and those were her real, while real surgically augmented breasts as opposed to stuffing as the original word we got. She's done adult video work and magazine stuff. She ripped her shirt off, 
revealing a shirt that said smells like ratings and did a strip tease on the table. Her and the stern cast of characters were supposed to be on the Meadowlands Raw but the show ran long. They were then supposed to be on the Binghamton Raw but the stern crew, in particular Hank the Drunken Dwarf, no showed Binghamton doing what drunken dwarfs do. Anyway the byplay went something like this. Jim Cornette said it may not smell like ratings, but like tuna. Other house shows this week saw July 15th in Columbus, Ohio drew $6,737 and $125,383, July 16th in Dayton, Ohio drew $7,341 and $144,779, July 17th in Louisville drew a near sellout $5,532 paying $109,193 and July 18th in Lexington, Kentucky drew $15,444 paying $273,309. Merchandise for the week was $313,421 or $7.85 per head. Raw will be preempted on August 31st and September 7th due to the U.S. Open, but will air on the following Friday nights both weeks. The December 6th London, England pay-per-view sold out after one week of ticket sales. They are attempting, but this isn't finalized, to add a December 5th show in Munich, Germany to that tour. Weekend ratings saw Livewire at 1.8 and Superstars at 1.7. The Reader's Pages The Gladiator I normally agree with your opinions of Japanese resting but I have to disagree on your writing about The Gladiator in the June 22nd issue. I've seen Gladiator have many four-star matches that contain stiff wrestling, high-flying and decent brawling. The transitions were also decent in exchanging moves despite the size difference against smaller opponents. Those matches were against awesome workers like Hayabusa, Masato Tanaka, and Yukihiro Kanemura. Granted, they did a lot of brawling to possibly camouflage some weaknesses, but the matches blended in a lot of styles. I notice a pattern in some people's opinions over the years when it comes to FMW. Most recognize their top stars as decent wrestlers, but also point out their flaws. Every style or promotion has its own niche. FMW uses the same wrestling style as ECW. It seems like these wrestlers have to deal with the stigma of being garbage-style wrestlers who have a few decent moves. But there is no denying the talent of wrestlers like Gladiator, Tanaka, Hayabusa, and Kanemura. They may not be completely versatile in adapting to All Japan or New Japan but they can adapt if given the opportunity. Hayabusa was always a decent worker, but he changed the tune of some critics who questioned his style when he went to All Japan. The same came probably apply to others. Ghetto is an awesome worker. I've seen him have decent brawling matches in Wings, FMW and IWA, but he can also have four-star matches as evident in his war matches against Chris Jericho in 1995 his performance in the 1995 J Cup and even some of his recent matches. But he has never been truly accepted as a wrestler who can be adaptable to all Japan or New Japan. Thus far he's had decent matches in both promotions. Can he also be chalked up as another decent garbage style wrestler or can wrestlers like him finally get their due respect? Music City Wrestling can thus far be chalked up as having the worst promotion, worst television show, worst booker, and worst television announcer. I followed this group since the demise of USWA I realized it wouldn't be as good in the beginning, but eventually would work out its early obstacles and mistakes. Boy was I wrong! The television show contains very few angles. Even less than all Japan. This makes it terribly boring since it doesn't contain the wild Memphis brawling or the decent interviews. Their interviews are generally weak, particularly Colorado Kid, Debbie Combs, Paul Adams, and Brickhouse Brown. The angles are beyond predictable. A mark with limited knowledge could book more compelling feuds and storylines. The television is worse than WCW worldwide. At least horrible shows of the past like Global had angels that were slightly compelling. The Music City television show contains so many flaws that I've seen two or three episodes where they had two different teams recognized as tag team champions on the same show. Burt Prentice is beyond terrible as an announcer. He never calls any moves, and constantly harps about no smoking, parking and other useless things about the matches in Nashville. I've seen tapes and televised matches of their big shows and most were a disappointment. I saw a five-minute scaffold match with a run and finish, long jobber matches, a decent Texas death match and boring undercards. Wolfie D vs. Flash Flanagan has been the only truly decent feud. The Rock and Roll Express can still pack the fans in small territories, but they've been so boring in Music City since Prentice has no clue how to use them. Granted, ECW isn't my cup of tea when it comes to wrestling but at least they try to be innovative and creative on their television show. There's nothing fresh, innovative or even interesting about Music City. Memphis Power Pro at least has its storylines. 
Eric Bimbin. Brooklyn, New York. WWF vs. WCW. Your comments regarding wrestling fans charging either WWF or WCW with copying another's gimmicks were right on. This has always been a copycat industry and both sides are guilty. The WWF is the babyface in this feud and WCW is clearly the heel because WWF is viewed as the underdog and America loves an underdog. Now the underdog is delivering the better product and the comparison isn't even close. WCW is atrocious, which is even more embarrassing considering the amount of talent they have. While both Bischoff and McMahon are going through midlife crisis before our eyes on national television, at least McMahon is entertaining in his role. WCW's reported success and profits strike me as a Time Warner shell game. Don't get me wrong. The gates are great and the company has made an unbelievable improvement, but how does this company expect us to believe they are profitable on their own? Do the math. This company spends an amazing amount of money on talent and advertising alone. On Bash at the Beach, take away $750,000 for Rodman's cut, and if it grosses $5 million, which I don't think it will, take away another $1,250,000 for Hogan's 25% and $500,000 for Malone and another $500,000 for advertising. That's $3 million right there before you pay for the rest of the talent, TV production, travel expenses and so on. And what does Kevin Green cost? Based on the base salaries that I know of, Hogan, Hart, Nash, Hall, Helwig, Piper, Savage, Goldberg, and Hennig, that's $14 million to $15 million on nine wrestlers, which is probably greater than the entire WWF payroll, and we're still not including Sting, Luger, Giant, or Flair. In the past year I've lived in both the Minneapolis and Philadelphia markets and when WCW comes to town, they saturate the market with radio ads on major stations leading to the events. That costs a lot of money. The point is, LUCW is merely a TV promotion that is doing great TV ratings for a media conglomerate that is willing to throw money at it. When the ratings die, WCW dies. That's why everyone can see the panic the last few weeks on WCW television. The funny thing is, even losing on Monday nights, the ratings are still great so what's the big deal? When WWF was getting killed in the Monday night ratings, it was still doing better than the average USA Network was doing in prime time, so what's the point? I think comparing WWF and WCW is moot because they are two different companies. Titan is a wrestling company that has to make money to survive. Pay-per-view is number one, followed by house shows and then television ratings. WCW is a television show that employs wrestlers. All that matters are the ratings. The Monday night battles are about nothing more than ego and bragging rights and their impact on the industry as a whole are greatly overrated. John McMullen. Westchester, Pennsylvania. Response from Dave Meltzer, let's say the combined base payroll for WCW wrestlers is $25 million this year, which is an enormous amount, and I don't know what the real number would be but that probably isn't far off. The company is probably going to gross $125 million to $150 million this year so it's only 20% of the gross so that hardly constitutes overspending for talent. Compare that percentage to that of most major league baseball, football and basketball teams and you'll see WCW salaries based on revenue aren't outrageous and that the company is easily making money on its own and the economics are getting better over the last year and not worse. For all the people who say WWF is a wrestling company and WCW is a TV company, the facts are that both run the same number of house shows and the same number of pay-per-view shows and from a business standpoint both are dueling fairly evenly. WCW produces more television right now but come the fall that will be evening up as WWF adds new shows. Those labels of wrestling company versus TV company make great phraseology for Vince McMahon to say to the media but the reality is as accurate as the idea that both companies have dropped the babyface and he'll rolls from their promotion. Both are basically in the same business doing largely the same thing, and both companies are grossing about the same number of dollars and both are running profitable businesses big time right now. Despite rhetoric to the contrary, Seemingly by WWF fans attempting to paint one company as the underdog and last year there may have been validity to that feeling, today neither company has significantly more money at its disposal than the other. The only financial advantage WCW has right now is because it is part of a larger conglomerate, it is probably better equipped to survive if the business hits an economic downturn. Undefeated Champions Joe Stecker and Dano O'Mahony were both undefeated wrestlers when they won their first world title. I don't know but it's also possible that Steve Casey and Wayne Munn were also. Some others came close. Earl Caddick lost his first match and Gus Sonnenberg lost his first shot at the world title beating Strangler Lewis. 
Ed Don George also lost his first shot at the title to Sonnenberg before winning the title. Branko Nagurski lost at least twice before winning the title from Luthez. Steve Yohe. Montebello, California. This is the end of this program. See you next time.